Claire Henson comes to us from the uh, Scottish Natural Heritage, uh, Natural Trust, sorry, Natural Trust, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, a, a woman who's uh, having studied at Durham University uh, got this jewel of a job to work in the, the Shangri-La of uh, Scotland, I think. Some of us want to go and visit Machu Picchu or the Patala in uh, Nepal and St Kilda, probably. And uh, Claire has been, is going to tell us all about her job there, um, and I'll not take any more of her time. Enjoy the evening. Hello. Um, yes, so I'm, I work for the National Trust for Scotland, and I'm going to talk about the archaeology of St Kilda, and then just a little bit about some of the work that we do, and then a little bit about what it's like to live on St Kilda. I realise I actually haven't mentioned the weather on St Kilda anywhere <laughs> in the presentation, which being British makes me feel deeply ashamed because it's my favourite topic. You do get weather. <laughs> I can confirm there is weather. Um, I'll just start by saying that it's really lovely to be back in Perth, and in particular in the AK Bell Library, because it indirectly or even directly played a role in me getting the job on St Kilda. I, worked for 12 months for the Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust in Perth before I was offered the post from St Kilda. And when I went for my interview, I borrowed some of the books from the AK Bell, which has an excellent resource on St Kilda, I have to say, to research for my interview. And when I was then offered the job, it was at the start of 2020, and the post was cancelled or postponed for a year. We went into a lockdown. I went out in 2021, the libraries weren't reopened, I'd never returned the books, but one of them was very useful, so I took it out with me to St Hill, and when I then started getting emails saying we're going to need that book back, I had to contact them and say, look, this is going to sound implausible, but um, the truth is, I'm on St Kilda and I've got your book, and can I keep it until maybe it's October? They were quite tickled with the story, and I ended up in the press, <laughs> as the archaeologist who basically stole the library book. <laughs> But yeah, it's quite nice to think you feel like you've come full circle a bit. Um, that book is The Buildings of St Kilda by Geoffrey Stell. It's an excellent book, and it now carries two stamps inside it to say that it was posted on St Kilda to commemorate the, uh, the fact that it actually travelled to the island and back. And I did get permission to stamp it. I didn't steal and deface a lie. <laughs> anyway, uh, St Kilda. Has anybody been? Oh wow, quite a lot of you, so you're probably going to know everything that I'm going to tell you, but hopefully not all of it. Um, back in 1827, right in a history of the Scottish people, a historian wrote of a desolate and rocky island in the North Atlantic, only reached with extreme danger to life. It was described as the last and outmost isle, but we now know it more commonly as St Kilda. And for some of us lucky enough, we even know it as home for up to six or seven months of the year. It's a place of superlatives, it's the biggest small place that you'll ever visit. It's the westernmost point in the United Kingdom. It boasts the highest sea cliffs in the UK at 400 metres. It also boasts the highest sea stack. It's the UK's only dual designated World Heritage Site, inscribed for both the natural and cultural heritage. It's home to over a million breeding seabirds, um, I believe the largest colony of North Atlantic puffins and one of the largest colonies of gannets. It also has endemic species unique to the island of mouse and wren. Throughout its history, it's been described as a place something apart, seen as somewhere that evolved along somehow separate lines. But one of the things that I'll do tonight in an overview of the archaeology of the islands is to hopefully demonstrate that from its earliest beginnings, through most of its history, it's actually shared a lot of commonality with the Western Isles and Scotland uh, more generally. <coughs> Just locating where St Kilda is, for anyone who doesn't know, it's 100 miles from the Scottish mainland and around 41 miles from North Uist, which is the nearest inhabited island. It's uh, actually the name of the archipelago St Kilda, which includes Herta, the main island, and the outlying islands of Borore, Soe, Dune. Uh, and that little box shows you where Village Bay is, which is the centre of most of the occupation on the island. It's quite a small island, like I say, it's only 2.2 miles across on its longest axis, but it has a presence which is much greater than that. It also has three large sea stacks, mm. Stack Levenish, Stack Narman, and Stack Lee, which is the one we're looking at there. Its exposed location in the North Atlantic adds to its sense of isolation, and 
to put it in some clear context, 400 kilometres approximately from County Durham, near where I grew up, and about 409 kilometres from the Faroe Islands, so that's about where it sits geographically. The archipelago itself is formed from a volcanic eruption that occurred 50 to 60 million years ago. The seabed around the Caldara, which forms the area around Village Bay there that we're looking directly into, the seabed there is around 50 metres deep, but off the edge of that, it shelves to around 150 metres deep. The rocks of St Kilda are all igneous, um, comprised of gabbros and granites. You can probably see, probably use the pointer, uh, this craggy sort of ridge along here, those are the oldest rocks, the gabbros, and then on the opposite side, they're slightly more rounded, where you get the slightly softer granite. It has a zigzag spine comprised of five separate peaks, which separates the island into two main glens, Glen Moor, or the Big Glen, on the north side of the island, and then Village Bay on the south. Village Bay is the only landing spot on the island, and as such, it's been the centre of occupation for around 5,000 years. Just looking very briefly at what makes a World Heritage Site, in order to be recognised by UNESCO, a site needs to meet uh, one of ten criteria that they set out, and St Kilda actually meets five of the separate criteria. It was first inscribed for its natural heritage in 1986. It was extended in 2004 to include much of the marine environment, and then in 2005 it was inscribed also for the cultural heritage. The cultural heritage of St Kilda has been recognised as a fossilised cultural landscape, which is the physical representation of a way of life that has now been largely lost. There is an impressive time depth preservation to the cultural heritage on St Kilda. The landscape that you see represents about the last 60 years of occupation and land use um, prior to the evacuation. Sorry, the last 60 years of occupation and land use are well preserved as a complete system that gives scale and perspective to the natural landscape that it exists in. The archaeology that you can see is a remote island response to a, the challenges of survival where you have access only to very <coughs> limited resources, in particular the reliance on the large seabird colonies. It not only has that incredible preservation of the physical <coughs> remains of the settlements, but it also has a very detailed documentary resource which stretches back up to four <coughs> years or more. So you get both of the possibilities of interpreting those sources alongside what we have physically surviving. We'll look at many ways that St Kilda is connected to the wider Hebrides, but it does also have unique features, most notably the Cretion that we'll talk about in a bit more detail later on. Those are the stone shelters with the turf roofs that we use mostly for storage. Although what's visible today on St Kilda is largely representative of uh, the 19th century onwards, the First human activity almost certainly dates much earlier to the Neolithic, around 5,000 years earlier. The Neolithic is typically identified as a period where you see the first settling of the land and farming, as opposed to the earlier hunter-gatherer lifestyle. But we also know that there's evidence along the Atlantic seaboard to suggest that the people then were exploiting the resources of the coast. You have sites there mentioned on the Western Isles. So, we're often asked on St Kilda not so much just when people arrived, but also why they ever came in the first place, because it's quite a formidable idea to try and cross an expanse of the Atlantic in the kind of rudimentary craft they would have used in those days. But it's actually highly visible from the Long Island on a clear day, and you can only imagine that if your existence relied on finding and exploiting those resources, you would have always wondered what was out there on this landmass that you could see. And I think once anyone had been once and seen the potential of St Kilda because of the huge seabird colonies, but also the fact you had cultivatable soils, which is sometimes um, quite you know, unique, uh, I think it's easy to see why they would have then wanted to return it again and again. The evidence for the Neolithic is quite scant. There was finds of a few shirts of uh, Hebridean ware pottery and also one or two small um, stone tools, but that's really the sum of that evidence. Moving into the Bronze Age, there is greater survival um, of stone tools in particular, 
There's an awful lot of stone tools that are found reused in the dry stone dikes all across the island, a real proliferation. Um, it is possible, that it's likely on St Kilda that they continue in use beyond the prehistoric because you don't have a source of metal ore. So after the date by which elsewhere we might have associated or the emergence of metal tools, they were potentially still using hoe blades and scrapers and on St Kilda. Um, the Bronze Age, we also have finds like the stray flint there that's in one of the burns which are typical of that period and also not naturally occurring flint doesn't occur on St Kilda so that is something that has been imported. There are also reports in the written accounts of what were almost certain kissed burials that sound very much like they were would have been Bronze Age. They relate to the minister describing improvement works and uncovering stone lined coffins with cairns on top of them. And one of them did survive the, the clearance and improvement of the 19th century, it was excavated in the 1980s, and the pictures there show the interior and the plan. So we do have, like I say, a great uh, wealth of both artifactual evidence and written evidence that is indicative of activity in that period and we have one surviving structure but nothing's actually produced an absolute date from the Bronze Age but that might be more reflective of the field work that's been carried out in the structures themselves. There remains questions about when St Kilda was permanently settled. It's possible that it was settled and abandoned for maybe up to centuries at a time but certainly by the time we get into the Iron Age we have structures that have produced dates from that period and also substantial structures that suggest an investment in harvesting and gathering that would allow you to remain there over winter because one of the things when you look at the numbers of Cletion you have to think is that was the investment you had to make in harvesting and storing your resources in the summer in order to survive through winter on St Kilda. And the most notable feature that uh, dates the Iron Age is a souterrain. Uh, these are quite common found across most of Atlantic Europe usually associated with an above ground roundhouse I've talked so much off topic that I've lost my place on my notes. <laughs> uh, it was discovered first by a farmer called John Gillies in the 19th century who um, quickly covered it over again because the, there is a lot of superstition in St Kilden folklore related to fairies and the presence of fae folk. And it was and still is known as the House of the Fairies which is passed down from the St Kilden times. It was excavated again at the end of the 19th century and then again uh, in 2005 and each time we learned a little more and it produced radiocarbon dates um, that dated to the Iron Age so it categorically does belong in that period and that makes it the earliest dated structure on St Kilda. They were always conventionally classed as a storage facility. I think there's now uh, some thought around whether or not there might be some more symbolic active offerings or gateways to a spiritual realm. Certainly the Suturin on St Kilda, um, logistically it would be quite hard to get stuff in and out of it. It's quite narrow and in inaccessible so it doesn't make entire sense as, a, as, as simply storage but beyond that would be quite speculative. There are also, um, th that's the scree slopes on, it's the mountains called Mullock Scar and there were structures dated there, there were no, there are a lot of sort of walls and structures that are partially now buried in the scree and one of these was excavated by Glasgow Archaeology in the 2000s. Um, it also produced a radiocarbon date as early as the 2nd century BC, so well in the Iron Age. It's hard to interpret what exactly those structures were for, they're very small. They did produce broken stone tools, there's an example of one there, and some pottery which might be more indicative of domestic use but they are very small and there was no evidence of hearths or anything like that that you might have expected to find if they were a dwelling. It's possible and I think it's been interpreted as uh, evidence of the scarcity of cultivatable land in the Iron Age that where now you have quite a clustered settlement around that improved land in the centre of Village Bay in that period you might have had more dispersed farmsteads that were spread right out across the whole bowl of, uh, of the bay exploiting the resources near water courses and it may, it may have been uh, associated with one of those. As we move forward in time, um, the first millennium AD which elsewhere is often defined by the comings and goings of 
the Romans, that far beyond the frontier, we look more towards the arrival of Pictish culture or the early church from Ireland. It's known from written records that monastic sites were established along the western seaboard and St Kilda itself was believed to have been possibly a site of eremitic pilgrimage. Those scree structures, actually there is talk of hermit cells, so for a while they were also interpreted as being something that might have been associated with that, that use. Um, many of the written accounts detail four or name four early churches, or two of which are dedicated to St Columba and St Brendan, so very, you know, the early Irish saint names, so likely to have been quite early in the establishment of the Christian church. Sadly, none of the chapel sites have ever been located physically. Um, there is a lot of map evidence which names them, so we're reasonably confident about the vicinity that they were in. Uh, the site there, St Brennan's, is out on the headland heading towards Ruabal, and half the investigative works, um, geophysics and some exploratory trenches, which have picked up fossil rectangular anomalies, but as yet nothing structural has been found. Christ Church, right in the centre of the village, down at the bottom, is possibly within the graveyard on St Kilda, which has always, to the best of our knowledge, been the burial ground. But that oval-shaped enclosure, again, is quite symptomatic of, of the enclosures you found around medieval churches. So it's possible that Christ Church might have been located within, within that. We do have three cross-marked slabs on the island. Um, shown there on the side of the slide, and stylistically they again are believed to date to between probably 700 and 900 AD, I know it gives a broader range on the top of that slide. Um, they're all reused as structural stone, the one at the bottom is in the roof of one of the cleats, uh, the one in the middle is on the side of one of the windows of the 1860s houses, and the top one, which was only discovered in 2010, is used as a, a slab over one of the drains along the street. And you can actually, it looks quite clear in that picture, but you can really only see it when you get the right slanting angle of light. We get into the period of the Vikings and uh, the Norse influence. So from the 8th to the 13th centuries, the Vikings are gradually colonising the Hebrides. And what begins as raiding parties ends in sort of established farming settlements. The islands themselves were part of the Kingdom of the Isles before uh, the Hebrides were passed to the Scottish Crown. The evidence for the Norse on St Kilda, a lot of it is in the form of the place names, several of which highlighted they have their origins in, in the Old Norse. Hertia um, is Old Norse for stag, so it could be the origin of the name Herta. So is Sheep Island, and Borrow means fortress. The name it's St Kilda itself doesn't actually come from any holy person, as you would think. It's quite possibly a 17th century cart cartographer's error, which might again be from the Norse, because the neighbour group of islands are called Skildar in the Norse, which eventually becomes Eskildar, which eventually becomes Saint, abbreviation Kilda. So there are quite a few in conflicting interpretations of where St Kilda gets its name, but that one does seem like the most credible. It's interesting to know if we're thinking about whether or not St Kilda was actually fully colonised during the Norse period, or whether it was somewhere that was seasonally visited from the Western Isles. The one clue might be that the place names are descriptive rather than territorial or possessive, so Oshaval is the East Hill, Ruval is the Red Hill, so it's been interpreted as, as being more Norse influenced than, than full colonisation. Uh, there are artefacts um, of, again, cultural, culturally belonging to the Norse period. Sadly, a lot of the, the, the artefacts themselves have been lost over time, and the details of where they actually originated on the island, certainly the brooch at the top there, again, they, it was found within a grave that was excavated. It supposedly went to a museum in Denmark, but the trail goes cold at that point. Um, the spearhead, which again is very characteristic of Norse culture, was found within the Souterrain in the, the late 19th century excavations. And the final piece of evidence for Norse activity on St Kilda is in the Icelandic sagas, one of which from 1202 AD mentions a cleric and his entourage taking shelter on the islands that are called Hurtia, which, you know, is again on, on route to Ireland. So. <laughs> Uh, that seems like 
a reasonable assumption to think that could have been St Kilda. Once we move forward through the medieval settlement between 1266 and uh, 1600, St Kilda was in the domain of the Lord of the Isles, and was eventually controlled by the MacLeods of Skye, who had their seat at Dunvegan Castle. The settlement uh, during the medieval settlement on St Kilda has never been um, confirmed in its location. I think one of the things that really surprised me when I first went out to work there is that for all, for everything we know about St Kilda, there's an awful lot of ambiguity still about where exactly the settlement was located over time. I mean, when you go back beyond what we see physically, most of which dates to the 19th century, um, you're still working from a lot of good guesswork and, you know, tying together again what we have physically and what we have written. So, in terms of the medieval period, this is an image drawn in 1812, but you can see that the village has a fairly amorphic, organic kind of layout. It's very different from the crescent shaped layout that we have today, and also very typical of a Highland settlement of that period. We assume that this is what the settlement on St Kilda would have looked like at that time. A very important date and a very useful source comes in 1697 when Martin Martin visits St Kilda and writes a very, very useful diary of his, uh, of his trip. And he also um, draws some, <coughs> again, useful maps. For all the inaccuracies that you can see on the map that's depicted there, it's also, you can, you can see the location of the three churches working off the rivers, you can get a sort of idea of where they were, and critically it shows the, the pyramids all over the hills, so we know that the Clesian were obviously in existence by as early as 1697. It's also seen as one of the real turning points in terms of the role of tourism on St Kilda, because it is the beginning of that process which will escalate and grow and ultimately shape the destiny of the islands to a degree, but it's the beginning of a record which supplies diaries, published accounts, eventually photographs, maps. Sadly, a lot of it, from the perspective of a the visitor, they bring an awful lot of bias and assumption to visits to St Kilda. There's not very, very few actual um, docu you know, transcripts or from the St Kilda Islanders themselves. A lot of it also translated from the Gaelic or inferred. So you have to treat it with a a degree of caution, but again, a sift through a lot of this wealth of documentation will often produce common threads that people have then taken to assume to be the truth um, amongst it. The other thing that Martin Martins describes when he visits in 1697 is the ancient dwellings of the St Kildans, which is very useful because if you made an assumption of what you might describe as ancient in, 19, in uh, 1697, you could potentially push that date back to a couple of hundred years and you might be getting close to a description of the, the medieval houses. Um, one of which, there's a building on St Kilda or a structure on St Kilda known as Callum Moore's house. It's quite famous um, and in the sense that it has you know, a, a name that people are curious about, but it's also, you can see it in the bottom corner there, it's, it's modified into a cleat, but it is demonstrably different in its construction to your average or standard cleat. Now, Martins described the ancient dwellings as having thick walls with cells within them and corbelled roofs, which perfectly describes the earliest um, phase of Callum Moore's house. It's the only standing structure on, in Village B that actually conforms to that description. So again, we're reasonably confident that that is in origin a medieval vernacular house. It's a rare survival because you, there are not a lot of those sort of everyday vernacular builds from the medieval surviving. So even outside of St Kilda, that would be quite a, a unique structure. Within the context of a dual world heritage site, I think that sometimes gets um, a little bit lost, but you know, um, it, the name Callum Moore was not a real person, it, it relates to it being a legend that a teenager named Callum Moore, more obviously meaning big, um, was left behind on a fowling expedition and to demonstrate his strength he built this house in a day. But there is I think a, a culture of those kind of tales of the strong man or, the, or sometimes more the patriarchal figure across um, the Hebrides and Highlands. 
it's interesting in the context of St Kilda where you do get episodes where the entire population was sort of decimated by disease or and the idea of maybe celebrating that notion of someone who looks who looks after the community there are other structures within village bay that have traces of cells in the external walls they're just notably larger than the other cliche they have a different shape they're more of a tall rounded beehive shape they're all or the majority of them are found together clustered slightly higher up the slope behind the modern street around a well known as Tuba Kilda which is a combination of Norse and Gaelic meaning well of the cold well the either there's one with a surviving cell some you can see the remains of where a cell came off them or you can see the footings of the cell on the ground they also have the sort of corbelling to the roof so that the ceilings rise gradually more like you would build an igloo stacking up like that those large cellular structures and we're kind of looking down i'll just use the pointer again there that little mound is Callum Moore's house there so it's in this area up here that you get these and extending beyond the edges of that picture that you get these large cellular structures which again we believe are likely to be some of the oldest surviving structures in the village bay area possibly predating even the 17th century also from that period we have cellular structures over in glenmore on the north side of the island glenmore is in a really compelling and fascinating place to visit because it has a totally different feel to village bay village bay is very orderly and you have the the crofting um, layout that's established later glenmore was was the grazing land where they took the flocks and the cattle so it's much wilder and it's all sort of the course of vegetation the rough grazing and then it is also where you find these 23 what are called cellular structures or sometimes horned enclosures they're very complex very multi-phase and it's not at all surprising that the first antiquarians and archaeologists to go and look at glenmore interpreted them as likely to be prehistoric in origin i look at them and can't believe they're not prehistoric i think you just really want them to be because you're in this really wild remote place that so few people get to visit because glenmore is just a bit too far in the turnaround of the four hours you get on a day boat to actually make it possible to go so it's one of the places that feels like a great luxury to be able to spend hours over there looking at these structures and pondering them and you find it hard to believe that they're not much older than sadly all of our available evidence would suggest but whilst they do share similarities with similar structures that are prehistoric on the Orkneys and Shetland they are also very typical of medieval shielings that you find across the Hebrides so a shieling being a temporary body or accommodation where you would go whilst you were tending your flock in the summer they're then modified like I say into these horned enclosures probably again around the 19th century which were a way of penning sheep and lambs separately so that you could milk the ewes whilst the lambs were present in a separate cell but couldn't actually uh, you know, suckle from the mothers. So the most famous of the cellular structures also has a name, the Amazon's House. <laughs> Martin Martins was taken to see the Amazon's House when he visited. Martins was a Gallic speaker, which is one of the other reasons why his account is so useful because he could speak directly to the natives and understand what uh, you know they were saying. He then translates the Gallic name, the House of the Warrior Women, into the Amazon's house, which we think is largely because his classically trained audiences in Edinburgh were more familiar with you know, the Amazons. Beyond that, we've no idea really where the name comes from, sadly, because it's really intriguing, but there's not anything else really in, in the literature or the folklore to suggest why it has that name. It's one of the most complex and interesting of the cellular enclosures you can see from the plan there how much there is going on you've got the remains of two medieval shielding huts an 18th century gathering fold with which would have the horns and then at least two 19th century cliches on top of it but i do strongly feel and it is just a hunch because the evident you know that the reinterpreting of glenmore all does make sense and none of the structures such as there's been investigation have produced any evidence that indicate anything other than agricultural activity or dates earlier than the medieval but they sit within an incredibly dense landscape of relic field boundaries and and there's rock shelters all around the sides of glenmore and 
it feels like there's a, an awful lot of investment in managing the land for perhaps just you know summer grazing activity and the very footings of some of the structures are very heavily grassed over um, kind of clumps of, of land of, of soil and stone so I'm just wildly personally speculating at this point because this isn't really anything that is in the conventional literature but sadly with archaeology where you've got extant structures the only way you would ever really fully understand the earliest origins would be to take them apart mm -hmm. and we're never really going to take those structures apart it's one of the upsides when they collapse um, that actually through the process of collapse you sometimes learn something new or you have the opportunity to make some small investigation but that's just putting a bit of a silver lining on, mm. on a dark cloud. Mm. I've got time check 25 minutes but I didn't actually start my stopwatch so who knows. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back at the location of the settlement there then so that's the crescent of the street coming around here. And the medieval we have up there centered around Callum Moore's house again, like I say, sort of based on some of those early early maps, there's a lot of um, early drawings, sorry, there is artistic interpretation, but you can sort of see from the other landscape features that haven't moved that the, they do sometimes position the settlement <coughs> higher up the slope. Moving into the post-medieval, we assume based on largely the presence of a lot of earthworks in the area indicated there, that the settlement had moved slightly further down slope. That's now quite close to the, the graveyard, which was also at that time the location of Christ's church. And there's been quite a bit of evidence looking at a particular drawing that I don't actually have on in this slide that shows the, the village on St Kilda. And Fleming, I think it was, who then did quite a lot of work looking at the position of possible stones you might could identify in photographs. And although it's speculative, the, the, that area of, of St Kilda above the street there, there is a different feel to the way everything's laid out. And some of the, the creeds, um, they're all sitting <coughs> on these earthwork remains of platforms and banks, and the alignments are slightly different to them. And so it's, it's apparent and correct that there is a, uh, the remains of something beneath that improved land, something that was cleared when they laid out this this field system and the arrangement of the black houses. Mm -hmm. But as yet again, there is not <coughs> the archaeological evidence to say trenches were opened or excavation was done and we've found footings and we've um, placed dates on them. The drawing there of the um, one of the houses, I think I might have missed a bit, where because Martin Martins did also give a description of the houses that people lived in in 1697, which is very useful as he describes the walls of their houses being rudely built of stone, the roofs covered with straw, and the whole secured by ropes made of twisted heath, the extremity of which on each side is placed with stone to preserve the thatch from blow, being blown away by the wind. Um, that description by Martins could again be describing villages anywhere across the Hebrides at that period, and those drawings uh, are. I think that isn't actually identified as St Kilda, but it is the type, exactly the type of black house that Martins was describing. So we believe that those more rectangular shaped buildings, they've got a sub-rectangular shape rather than the rounded shape of Callum Moore's house, and you can see that shape in some of the earthworks located in that area around the, around the churchyard. When we move on to the end of the 18th century, the, there were improvements across the estate of Harris, which included St Kilda, and potentially we think part of those improvements is the building of a combined taxman's house and store, which is slightly removed from the village, and you can see, uh, it should be marked on that, um, sorry, I'll move on, I'll point it out on the next slide, if, if you've been, it sort of lies on the eastern extremity of of the, he the, the sea cliff. Um, it was close to the landing spot that they used before the pier that exists now was built. The taxman came from the estate annually and he came to collect rent, inspect works, settle disputes and deliver goods. The arrangement with the estate worked such that the, they claimed in rent a percentage of the island's produce and again when you go through the written reports that varies quite wildly from 
all the dairy produce uh, to huge amounts of seabirds and they arrived with a large entourage of people. So St Kilda always produced in vast quantity. In fact, for most of its history, the arrangement with the estate was that it generated profit for the estate. They would collect whatever percentage of the goods that they were going to take in rent and they took the surplus and they took a list of what the St Kildans required they would then sell the goods, buy the required items and keep whatever was left over. And like I say, all by the last sort of hundred or so years, that St Kilda was actually generating money for the estate. Um, however, some of the written accounts do make it seem as if the demands placed by the factor and his entourage were pretty onerous in terms of how much stuff they were, they were required to provide. The store is a multi-purpose building. It was the first modern building, which you can sort of see just by looking at it, compared to the black houses, probably look quite foreign and strange to the St Kildans. It's quite imposing. It also was the first to use imported materials such as slate and lime. Um, and it was built, likely masons came over from the estate to construct it. The upper floor was used as storage, and the lower floor was used as accommodation. <coughs> And as such, when the taxman wasn't there, it was empty for large parts of the year. So there's interesting anecdotal accounts in the written records suggesting they had meetings and sermons and even Cayleys and sort of more social gatherings in the store. Today, it's used by the National Trust for Scotland. It's reversed the upstairs as accommodation, the downstairs we use as storage. But Myself and at least one other person in this room can attest that it is also used for the occasional impromptu Cayley um, when we gather together and celebrate an occasion. Uh, if we move forward in time to the 18th and 19th centuries, a period that is characterised across the Highlands by the Highland Clearances, which I think most will know is a complex and sad series of events which largely shapes not just the Highlands but through the process of emigration large parts of the world. This is one of the first points in the history of St Kilda where it actually deviates from what is the uh, what is happening elsewhere because because of the value of what St Kilda produced and because of the profit from industrial scale fouling, the value of feathers um, for one thing was always quite buoyant um, even into quite late in St Kilda's history. Also likely because it was quite isolated from the landlord and the taxman. It survives the kind of top-down approach of clearing the lands of people in agriculture for large-scale sheep farming. The arrival, the, the minister previously, when the taxman visited, he used to bring a, visit, a minister with him who would perform marriages and baptisms from the previous year. In 1829, you have the arrival of the first minister who stays on the island, and that marks really the first wholesale improvement on St Kilda so it comes slightly later and not in the same rather brutal top-down way that the clearances happen across large parts of the rest of Scotland. At this time you also get the building of the church and the manse. Um, you could fill a whole hour debating the role of religion and the church on St Kilda. It's quite a divisive topic. It's clear from the presence of those cross slabs and the Christian churches that you know it was a Christian community from quite early in the in that the spread of that across the <coughs> across the British Isles. You later get the arrival of uh, the free church in a more steer form of of worship and I think it's a complex and interesting subject. Like I say you could fill a lecture on that alone but sometimes I think it's important again not to do what the visitors did in the 19th century and project our own ideas of what is right and wrong back onto people several hundred years ago. Yes, there are accounts which talk of the St Kilda's being, you know, loving singing and dancing and being a very happy folk. And I think there's often this idea that they were happy and carefree and then the church came and crushed it all out of them. And, <laughs> but equally, there are very valid sources that indicate that a lot of the preaching that was done was very sort of hellfire and damnation. So, the Church of Mans are built in 1827-28 by a design by Robert Stevenson, more famous for lighthouses, part of the dynasty. Um, it was through the efforts of the Reverend John MacDonald, known as the Apostle of the North, who was a great Gallic preacher of the day, and 
the Society of the Propagation of Christian Knowledge, who raised funds for the building of the church and manse in the same position where they still stand today and in desperate need of the roof replaced presently. Uh, again, it was constructed by a team of base and set in the estate in Skye, and you are beginning to see what would eventually become a bit of a separation between the houses of the native population along the street and then the more estate buildings which tend to be clustered there towards the landing point where you have the church, the manse, the feather store. And eventually you'll have the factor's house built along the street, possibly on, on a plot of land that was fortuitously empty following emigration to Australia, possibly because it seems to stand right at the beginning of the street and possibly marks something of a symbolic conduit between the flow of goods you know, through the island via the estate. Uh, Neil Mackenzie was on the island from 1829 to 43, and that is largely the period where we see St Kilda, as we know it, essentially come into being. He was um, horrified by the conditions that he found the St Kilda's were living in. Again, important to stress that actually it would have been very typical of anyone living in black house communities, it was no better and no worse, but there are quite lurid accounts of they lived in single room black houses along with the um, cattle over the winter. Uh, over the winter the midden was allowed to build up in the middle of the black house, manure from human and beast, uh, innards, seabird, entrails, everything went into the midden. Supposedly, it got so bad that you could only really stand upright right in the middle of the black house by the end of the winter. And then in the summer, they raked it all out in the spring and dug it into the land. Um, it does sound pretty horrible. <laughs> but also, it's, you look at the, the reuse of, of commodity in the St Kilda economy, and we could learn a lot from it because nothing went to waste. I mean, you know, thatch went onto the roof, so it got soaked with soot, it was taken off the roof and dug into the fields, the crops grew, were harvested, and the straw went onto the roofs, and I just always think how much it must have pained them to ever accept something just could not be put <laughs> to any kind of reuse. But. So Mackenzie um, largely stimulates a, a, a phase of improvement, starting with the laying out of the crofting um, the crofting system and the building of the black houses which survive along the street today. They're indicated there, they're built gable end on towards the street, so they have a gable end towards the sea. Each family was to be allocated a plot of land. It was very egalitarian, the society on St Kilda. There was a rotation of plots and fouling allocations, so no one ever had you know, the rights to the best bits in perpetuity. I think that only became fixed to them belonging to certain families post 1830s. They petitioned the, the landlord, the, the taxman who came out to allocate the apportionments and in something which might be a unique episode, the community decided they weren't happy with it and reallocated it themselves in what was a more fair distribution. So it results in the present shape that we see today. You have um, a 2.5 kilometre long head dike enclosing the land from the the, the sheep and cattle would have been outside that, uh, and then you have these linear field boundaries delineating the crofts running down to the sea there, and then the street through the middle. The 1830s black houses were a marked improvement on the predecessors. They also he encouraged the use of midden pits, so all the manure and the entrails went into those rather than just building up on the floor. They um, had one, if not more, windows, and they also had a central division, a talon for, so you then had humans and cattle living separately. They were, they would still have been quite cramped and quite smelly and dark, but they would have been very warm, and again, you know, for that, that period, very typical of, of the type of accommodation that people were living in. From this period, you also get the Cletian, the Cletian, uh, we saw from Martin Martin's map that they predate the 1830s by several hundred years. We don't know exactly when you know, the first ones were built. Again, it would be fascinating to find out, but archaeologically quite challenging because you'd probably have to take one fully to bits um, or look for soil deposits inside, etc. Uh, 
what we do get in this period is because you get that clearance of the village B area, you get these very large Cretan being built, the ones that are quite typical in the images that you see of St Kilda. The construction method of the cleats uh, is really ingenious. I, I kind of wish that that particular cleat looks quite regular um, from the front. It also has that lovely patch of sea pinks on the side, which always makes it look a bit like it's intentional that it had a bit of a shrubbery going on. But um, when you look at them, they're incredibly irregular, the, the construction. And I think there's often an assumption that they are badly made because they look quite uneven. But there are two skin construction, the interiors of them, the stones are perfectly angled to create a rising upward batter with all the weight going out over. They use incredibly big stones on the interiors of the collision. They didn't, wouldn't shy away from putting something that probably weighed well over half a ton, three metres up. Um, and they select them for the angle so that they rise evenly. The result is that the skin that is outside, which is effectively just a ballast to hold that internal skeleton um, in place, because it's pushed directly up against the back of the stones, which have been selected for the angle on the internal face, you develop that very rough looking sort of profile. They were used for storage and they needed a wind flow through them for drying things out. And it's quite remarkable, you can go in them on a very warm summer's day and they're perfectly cool. And you know you can feel that sort of, that breeze through them. The turf roof kept the water tight. So again, that two skin construction is largely a method of creating stability without using a lot of hearting, which you would usually put in a dry stone structure because you don't want those gaps filled up. You need to make something strong but gappy. So they achieved that quite, quite brilliantly. They were storage facilities. Again, as far as we know, they, in the village, they would have been storing their harvested crops, veg, tools. I mean, they really are huge in the village. One of them is eight metres long. I mean, I imagine they function just like your garden shed in a lot of ways. You know, anything you weren't keeping, your ropes, maybe ladders, whatever, would go in the cleats. I do also, I can't help but wonder if there's a little bit of one upmanship about it. You know, have you seen the size of the cleat he's building down at the end of the village? Because they are enormous and um, very impressive. Much, much bigger than out, out on the rest of the island, where they're predominantly quite a lot smaller. Um, elsewhere they were used for the storage of peat and turf, so on the hills where Martins indicated the pyramids, they're like it would have been for fuel storage. Near the bird colonies they'll have been storing carcasses and eggs for drying them. Some of them look like they're clustered in depots between the bird colonies and village bay, so maybe it's somewhere that you could go in the winter where you didn't have to go all the way over to say the Camber or the far end of Glenmore. I do wonder if some of them are simply for harvesting where you've got good grass sward and for winter fodder because we know some of the enclosures or the majority of the enclosures on St Kilda are exclosures for keeping stock out and growing crops but some have produced nothing but pollens for grasses so we think they were actually just that winter fodder was such a precious resource they were actually just meadows effectively and you get cleats on some of those slopes where you have you know the bird colonies you're not on the peat and I do wonder if it's just because they grow really good grass and they were sort of storing that in there. What's really nice is there are cleats that still have cut turfs within them, one or two. And I've found a couple which we didn't have recorded that there were turf in them. But that always feels quite a special moment when you know that you found something that was stacked there by the people who built these structures and lived on this island with a mind to coming back when they needed it in winter. And I, 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 it's so tempting to think I'd love to take that back and burn it. You know, that would feel like, again, fulfilling a cycle. But I'm an archaeologist and I don't burn things that have historic value. Um, so I never have, and I never will. Um, so there's 12,071 12, patients um, on Herta, and another 200 on the outlying islands. So a huge number. They wouldn't all have been in use all at once. They were likely have been collapsed and rebuilt. Um, there's definitely, I think, also an element of hiding the scale of the harvest going <coughs> on because with that number spread out the way they are, you kind of think, well, if the landlord was coming to assess how much produce they had, <laughs> they were never going to get to all of those cleats ever. So I think there's definitely a bit of that going on. 
Moving forward, on the 27th of September 1860, a, a, a hurricane, as it was described, brought untold destruction to the island. It decimated the grain crop, destroyed a small harbour, and, harbor, and tore the roofs off the 1830s black houses, which were only 30 years old at that time. Um, there was, again, a public cry for um, help and assistance for St Kilda, which to a degree embarrassed the landlord into funding a second phase of improvements, the last sort of wholesale change of the domestic housing stock, when we see the building of what are called the 1860s white houses. So they are built with the principal elevation facing the bay. They were fitted in between the existing black houses, which from that point on were mostly used as barns and buyers. Um, but again, I don't have it in this presentation, but at this point, there is also a plan drawn up by the estate mapping the allocations on St Kilda, which is an incredibly useful resource because it names who was held um, each croft. And it also gives an idea of some of the cleats that are below the village there in the fields are drawn on, on Shalva Plan. And so you can really get a feel for what was going on at the time. It, it, it details things that are going to be built. Um, as well that, you, that, that aren't there now, so you have that sense of it was a work in progress, but I was just when I was looking at my notes for this thinking I should really have included it at that point. Um, the White Houses again were built by Masons from Sky. They were a huge improvement in a general sense, facing the elevation to the bay meant they got much more light, so it was much easier for carrying out things like weaving activities, they were not popular with the St Kilns initially because they were prone to leaks and condensation. They had zinc roofs on a bit originally. Um, a lot of the older St Kilns chose to stay in the black houses and I can sort of see why. I think a black house with a constantly burning fire and those big thick walls and that roof probably would have been more appealing than one of the new cottages. Eventually, they, not, not long after they were constructed, they replaced the roofs with tar and felt. Um, and I think that addressed a lot of the issues of the cold and the damp, but um, they were actually of that period among some of the most sophisticated housing on the Hebrides, and it's been remarked that the street on St Kilda was the most modern street in the Highlands by some commenters on, at the time. It's around this time as well, sort of the mid-19th century, that tourism really picks up, and the islanders discover a new source of income through the selling of things that they produce, trinkets, um, uh, woolen, uh, woven goods and eggs. Actually, I think there was a market also in rare birds' eggs um, from St Kilda, um, selling them to visitors. It's around this time also that you get visitors starting to treat St Kildans like they are a kind of people that time forgot or a race apart. And there is quite fascinating, uh, amusing accounts of the St Kildans feigning you know, no knowledge of a shoe or horror at a pocket mirror. So they would definitely applying a crafty degree of playing up to this. So again, when you read the accounts of what life was like on St Kilda, I, you like to hold a bit of hearty scepticism and just think, well, they were being, to a degree, treated like a curios in, a, in an exhibition, so if they could get something out of it good for them, that's an advert there for one of the steamers that was then going. Uh, the First World War, moving into the 20th century, brings very mixed fortunes for St Kilda. Fortunes that ultimately shape, again, part of its, its final fate. Um, prior to the outbreak of the war, there was radio masts installed. You can see one of them, that's one of them there in front of the factor's house. Um, that, they were for a naval detachment stationed on the island who were monitoring shipping in the Atlantic. During the, the war itself, there was a, the, a U-boat attack it apparently sailed into the bay and they loud hailed to announce that they were going to attack. Their target was the radio masts and what they believed was the power store for them in the feather store. Um, the damage reported was quite considerable. The store was destroyed, there was damage to the church. You can see the damage there to the factor's house, but thankfully the, the death toll was only one lamb. <clears throat> so no people were, were killed. As a consequence of this, a naval gun was installed with a um, attached, I mean, uh, the name's got munition store. It was never used um, in anger, and it has also become one of those sort of quirks of a rare survival, because most of these installations were replaced in the Second World War elsewhere, 
But because St Kilda by that point was unoccupied and um, of little or no use to either side, um, it remained and it's become quite unusual in its survival. The First World War brings that sense of connection for the first time with the wider world. Not, you know, to, to a larger degree, you've actually got radio transmissions, and that's it doesn't start, but it certainly feeds into a process of a growing, perhaps, awareness that there is a life in a world outside St Kilda, <coughs> which is one of the factors which ultimately leads to the evacuation of the island in the at the end of the 1930s, at the beginning of the nineteen thirties. The reasons for the evacuation are uh, complex and various. Um, I've demonstrated that St Kilda is very similar to a lot of Hebridean islands up to the 18th century, and actually this process of you know, communities abandoning islands is seen elsewhere. St Kilda is certainly not unique. The value, as I said, that the island had always produced more than enough to support itself, but that changed as you go into the late um, the, you know, through the 19th into the 20th and 21st century. Essentially, the island continued to produce, but the value of what was produced changed. You also had a growing dependence on that trade with visitors through tourism and also through imports. It was a more vulnerable way to exist because if, if a shipment of coal didn't arrive and you haven't invested the time to cut your peat and turf and store them and dry them for the winter, you're just left with no fuel supply. So the fortunes of the island become a bit more turbulent. The arrangement with the estate is by this point more like a welfare system where they're supporting more than they are, it's generating. And then you get processes of, of immigration, so you get exoduses to Australia, and a, a, a predominantly of young, the young people. So you reach a point shortly before the evacuation where you have a contracted population, an aging population, and there simply isn't the, the vigor uh, or the will to um, continue. So, uh, sadly, there's a scene there of people sitting on, on the jetty. When they reach a point where they petition the government for evacuation, and on the 29th of August 1930, on the HMS Harebell, the last 36 remaining islanders leave Village Bay, they left behind in their homes a Bible open at Exodus and a handful of oats in the hearth. And, it's fair to say their departure marks the severance of an association between people and place that was forged for thousands of years. But the ruins of the last hundred years of their lives have left such a compelling, fascinating story that it still draws over 5,000 visitors a year. And there is that palpable sense of, you know, um, it's... I always think it's a bit sad that thousands of years of surviving are often reduced to this one event, the one point where, you know, they... And they're such bravely encouraging the decision to leave, to go, we, can't, we just can't make it work anymore. That's not giving in, that is electing to basically do what is right for you in your community. But you can't ignore the roofless houses and the sense of pathos that's all around you. You can see why it's a really compelling place for people to visit. One of the final chapters in St Kilda's story. Uh, so in the 1930s there were, steamers still went out, some of the islanders returned seasonally and still reoccupied their crofts. But with the outbreak of the Second World War, the steamers stop and the island is almost fully evacuated. But we do have three um, air crash sites on St Kilda. There's a Bristol Bogue fighter that crashed on the side of Conacher in 1943. There's a wreck of a Wellington on Soy, which wasn't discovered until 1957. And it's one of two, two that went missing in the area, but they're not absolutely sure which one. And then in Glenmore, a flying boat, very big plane. Um, was on a training flight uh, right at the end of, towards the end of the war. It's, its next, its last expedition was going to be to protect convoy in North Africa, which apparently was a relatively safe coasting. So they, they'd made it through, you know, I think. Um, it was reporting every hour, and it reported at 11 and nothing more was heard. So when they eventually were able to dispatch a, um, a, a boat to St Kilda to look for it, they found the wreckage high up on the side of Glenmore, agonisingly close to the watershed. So they think it just came up the glen in bad weather and <clears throat> didn't manage to quite clear the land. They found the nine crew members sadly dead. <clears throat> it's a very big plane, like I say, and there was a worry that other planes sighting the wreck, um, it may become the cause of further crashes. So the decision was taken to try and break it up and disperse some of the wreckage. <clears throat> 
And I'll show you, this is something which, this summer I was over in Glenmore, <laughs> and I found this bottle tucked under a rock, up on the, high on the west side of Glenmore, uh, tucked right under a rock. Um, and I must admit, I looked and thought it, late, you know, probably post sort of military occupation, it does have that kind of rusted metal top, and I don't know what's in it, I couldn't get it open, I didn't try too hard. <laughs> um, and then I looked at the bottom, I took a quick photo of the, the glass stamp, when I got back to the man, I did a, a cursory bit of investigation, and that PG Co, I think is the Portland Glass Company, who were actually only operational from about 1928 to about 1958, so it's a bit of a weird period on St Kilda, because it spans sort of the evacuation, but only just. And then it only just clicked the arrival of the military in the, in the mid-century. And so then I, but I got to thinking, actually, where it was on the side of Glenmore was very near the big caches of wreckage from the Sunderland. So I did ponder whether or not it might have been brought there by the crews in, in 1943 to 4 who were going over, walking from Village Bay every day for a month, manually breaking up the plane and dragging the large parts of the wreckage. Because it's a bit off the beaten track, and like I say, just the way it was tucked under the rock where you might leave your water bottle to stay cool if you're doing some work. So I did take a little shot of myself, possibly, <laughs> to see with their water bottle where they might have taken their break. But moments like that are quite almost spine tingling when you feel like an average day turns into something quite profound where you have a possible link with some phase of activity, a very sad, tragic event in the history of uh, the island. 1957, you get the arrival of a human presence, the like of which St Kilda has almost certainly never seen. Uh, Operation Hard Rock, which was the first phase of the, the military occupation of the island. Um, again, you could fill a whole talk with the post-1957 history of St Kilda. I think one of the most interesting details, at the time, the 1860s houses, you know, they were only, you know, less than 100 years old and only abandoned for you know, 27, nearly 30 years. The original proposal for the, the road which runs around here was to put it straight along the line of the street, flatten all the structures for uh, hardcore for the road. And fortunately, just before the military arrived, um, the island had been given to the National Trust of Scotland in a combination of the Ministry of Works, the National Trust, and the Nature Conservation Council sort of went, oh, maybe, maybe we'll not do that, but what a different place it would have been. There's still a military base on St Kilda, uh, occupied, um, so it's an, it's, it's an abandoned island in the sense that nobody lives there permanently, but there is a, a continuous human presence. Um, so I'll quickly go through one or two things just about the work that we do and what life is like on St Kilda. Um, that's a lovely picture this, from this year, just looking at those really big cliches um, just below the head dike in part of the improved land. My job is to monitor the condition of a lot of the structures. We monitor all the structures, that's the 1200 cliches, the black houses, all enclosure walls, everything, on a rotating 10 year cycle. And we repair 311 of the cliches, predominantly in Village Bay, but some of them elsewhere, just to preserve you know, the appearance and the integrity of the monument. This is one that I went to visit this year. It's a very well constructed, very nice cleat. But if I show you approximately where it is, down there, <laughs> those are very steep slopes. I mean, your hands go a bit clammy looking at that standing here, but it's not very nice having to get down there. And that's one of those ones where you just think they were definitely hiding stuff down here. I mean, <laughs> that was sort of, you know, the, the fact I had. It's such a big cleat that you think, it can't have been convenient. It's not the other bird colonies, you know. But I love, a day out going somewhere like that is just a great adventure, you know. And then there's things like this. This is also high up on the west side of Glenmore. It's underneath a very big boulder, not really on any of the routes anywhere. I was finishing up a day doing some monitoring in Glenmore, and as I was making my way out, I happened upon this, and a quick check of my um, records demonstrated that it's not been recorded before. That's not to say nobody's seen it before, but you know, there's been three comprehensive surveys of St Kilda, and that's never been picked up. And you know, he often asked as an archaeologist what's the best thing you've ever found, and I think these will be right up there, you know. Finding a new structure on St Kilda is just, that's a brilliant day in anyone's book. 
And then we have this, sadly, the we have a big backlog of dry store repair work to do. You know, we lost nearly two full seasons of work in 2020 and 21 through the pandemic. So we're basically trying very hard to make inroads into this. We repair on St Kilda to a very exacting standard. Like I say, the, the stonework, the way that they built is what, um, in no small part, what makes the islands, gives them the appearance that they have. It's, it's part of the, the fundamental spirit of St Kilda. We replicate them stone for stone to the earliest photographs that we have in most instances. So this black house gable in 2001 and then again in, uh, sorry, in 2008 and then in 2014. But on the next slide, you'll see what happened in between. Oh. And I particularly like how despondent the two people standing on the side look because they're about to try and fix that. Um, so yeah, when, when they go, they go big and you know, it's a huge, a huge amount of work. We'll look just quickly at this structure. This is Fleet 85, and that collapse sadly happened the January before last, January 22. Fleet 85 is better known as Lady Grange's house. Lady Grange was um, imprisoned on St Kilda in the early 18th century. Her husband was a prominent Jacobite, and when they separated after many years of marriage, many children, he thought she might um, betray him to the crown, so he had her kidnapped and ultimately brought to St Kilda for imprisonment. Now that structure is known as Lady Granger's house, but it's only recorded as Lady Granger's house as late as 1927 when the US first served St Kilda. By that point it's 200 years past those events, so that has categorically come through the oral tradition of the St Kildans through several generations, but you're well into the period then of um, visitors arriving and asking questions and, and a degree of curiosity, particularly about Lady Grange. <coughs> By that point, the story is quite well known. And th this, this plea does lie within the area of the village where we think the settlement was in that period, where those earthworks that I was talking about earlier are. There's nothing about it that looks anything other than a, than a cleat. It's possible it's on the footings of the black house that she was imprisoned in. Descriptions of where she was imprisoned just sound like a black house, they, you know. It's possible it just sits within the area of the village at that time, but I really quite like the idea that this big, misshapen, tiny-doored, no-windowed structure looked much better as a prison to a curious visitor than one of the black houses. So when people came on the street and said, where was Lady Grange in prison? They just pointed at that. And whichever way you, whichever of those is correct, that structure has a very high significance in respect of its association to a named historic individual and its potential to link the physical evidence on St Kilda and the written evidence about St Kilda, which is actually quite an elusive thing to do. As I was saying, when things collapse, it sometimes gives you an opportunity to learn a bit more. Unless you find a stone mark, Lady Grange was here. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever be able to say. We might even we might get to a point where we say there could be a black house footing in the base of the wall. That only makes it a black house from that period potentially. But you know, it's a it's a very sad one to have suffered such a bad collapse because of its the preeminence of the story. We have an excellent photographic record for it. That picture's from 1920, and you can see I had that curious little door which. A lot of the, most of the structures in the village, the police would have had a door of some sort, but I, I'm sure that one had its little door because it was Lady Granger's prison. And <laughs> this rough planking door just really fit. You can see how much that would excite a visitor who'd come to see this horrible place where this, you know, dignitary, um, you know, from Edinburgh was carted off to. But so that one is very much on the pending list. Um, I'll show you a very quick couple of um, pictures of what life is like for us on St Kilda. Um, here we are, this is just a little, it's a Cayley in uh, <laughs> well, the interior of one of the cottages that we use for accommodation. Those are researchers from the Sheep Project, so and my two colleagues Craig and Sue, the bird ranger and the, the ranger. Um, we get a lot of activity and interest from the television, so here we are hobnobbing in our best bib and chocker. Um, all in our nice corporate jackets with Ben Fogel who came and filmed Scotland's Lost Worlds last, last year. Um, this looks like some homeless people gathered around a bin, but it's actually the most western beacon for the Queen's Jubilee, which we lit on the side of Mullock Scar 
um, last season. So that's again my two colleagues and one of our bosses, Will. And this is the most Westerly Street party for the Queen's Jubilee. We've got some of our lovely volunteers there. We have volunteers that come out and participate in the work that we do. We really they contribute uh, an invaluable and immeasurable amount to both the you know the, the maintenance of the island and the, and the social side. I often think that archaeologists, when they talk, really disappoint people because they want to hear about people <laughs> and. Personally, I know that I'm always talking about the rocks and the stones and the structures and you kind of forget about the humans at the heart of the story that actually everything we're doing is trying to extrapolate a life from those stones. So I thought I would just share a few snaps of the community on St Kilda because it's an honour to, to repair those structures. You know, the people might be gone but you feel their presence around you all the time and I think especially when you're lifting stones back into walls and you think about the hands that have placed those stones back in that wall over the years, you just think, this is a dream. But it is also, you know, it's very sad. It's sad to think that, you know, they were so, you often think if they'd been there when the military arrived, it would have brought a, a huge amount of work to the island, and it might still be an occupied working Hebridean island, and it would be an entirely different story. But one thing that we have started to do, which I'll finish with, is on the anniversary of the evacuation on the um, 29th of August. We take effectively a census photo of the island now, so we gather together anyone who's on the island, and people in that photo work at the, some work at the military base, some work for the sheep project, and um, there's us from the NTS, and there's some people who are just there camping, and we're kind of trying to start a tradition of basically getting together the, the modern South Kilda community to, to pause and reflect both on why we're all there and how very lucky we are. So that's a picture from the solstice in 2022 and that is the end of my talk. <laughs>
you mentioned the endemic mouse species, and I was wondering generally, uh, for land animals that live on the island, how did they get there and when? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of it, again, like everything, is somewhat lost in the midst of time because there is this huge documentary, uh, you know, huge wealth of documentary evidence about St Kilda, but I think it's always important to remember it spans a tiny fraction of the history of those islands. When you get into those written records, I mean, they chart periods when they had ponies, goats, chickens, cats and dogs quite abundantly, obviously two separate breeds of sheep that were on the islands, there was a black face that was actually the ones that they um, that they kept and for their flocks, and then a, the purebred soys, um, who they were on the neighbouring island of soy, uh, they had cattle, um, and then there was originally two species of mice, the mouse that survived is actually a, a wood mouse, and there was a St Kilda, there was a a field mouse and a house mouse. I think it's the house mouse that became extinct after the islanders left. So within that period of written records, we have an idea of when um, they, you know, of certain times when they had certain animals or they didn't, or when they brought them or at the evacuation. It's quite sad. I think they they, they drowned the dogs in the bay, which I mostly seems a bit brutal. But then knowing dogs, you think they would have tried to swim after the boats, you know, I guess and. Um, uh, they let the the black faced sheep were took away and um, they were sold. Um, I think by that point the the last of the ponies I think had gone by some time earlier. But there's also that history of exploiting the seabird populations and it's quite curious to try and work out some of the written accounts, the numbers of eggs and birds that they were taking are astronomical. So you know obviously we're in a climate of watching a decline in those, all those populations. And it's very hard to work out what impact that harvesting was actually having on, well, I mean, they were sustaining, obviously, because they sustained them for thousands of years. But then you do have extinctions, the great orc, the last great orc was apparently killed on St. Kilda. And like, there was that trade in rare birds' eggs, so, you know, raptors and other creatures by the, you know, other, other species of bird by the time you get into the Victorian period. So, um, I don't know if that's answered in some part. Um, looking at your photographs, it looks as if the landscape as it now is, is partly maintained by sheep grazing. Mm. Is it known or reasonably conjectured what the landscape and vegetation would have looked like before humans arrived? I think, um, yeah, you probably could arrive at, uh, I guess, at what it would have looked like because the <coughs> neighbouring island of Doom hasn't been grazed and when you see how um, thick the, the sort of vegetation has grown on Doom and actually in a lot of the archive images, I don't know if I, could, if I just went back, when you see pictures of the village even when the St Kilds were living there, even into the 19th century when you had all the improvement in the village, the, it's still a lot, th the grass is still a lot um, thicker. Um, but then they wouldn't have allowed sheep into that area of the village for most of the summer growing season. There's actually gaps in the head dike that they just blocked up from time to time, and in the autumn they let them in to graze the stubble and break up the ground and fertilise, and then they would have been driven out again in the summer. So it's possible those pictures, because a lot of them are taken by tourists, so they would only have come in the summer, actually reflect you know, the growth then. It's funny, I mean, the grass for all, the, the sheep population on St Kilda, is very large and much bigger than when the St Kilda's were there. They are hefted, so they remain far higher numbers in Village Bay than over in Glen Bay. Um, but on a, in a summer like this, I mean, we had a severe drought, and then once the rains came, it's remarkable how much the grass still grows up. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword in some ways, because obviously they're fertilising as they go, but I know in terms of the biodiversity, it would be quite interesting to see more areas I mean, and in terms of the archaeology, but for different reasons, where the sheep were excluded to see what species you might get, um, certainly in the botany as well. Would there ever have been trees? No, we think not. There was pollens found from birch, I think, in the peats on the col between Mullet Moor and Conica. And I think for a time they thought possibly there might have been some wood tree coverage, but I think it's now largely accepted it's probably wind blown from the Hebrides because. St Kilda, I believe, is the windiest place 
in uh, the UK or I'm talking about weather, got the weather in, uh, but it does see, I mean, 100 mile an hour in the bay is, in the winter is not uncommon. There is a species of tree that was on St Kilda a dwarf willow, but I think we're talking. I don't know what it looks like, because I feel like, I feel like some kind of gulliver, I find you know, striding through a dwarf willow forest, but I, I've never taken the time to find, to find out. It's got heather on all the hills as well, and that's one of the times when I always kind of miss home, when you get to that time of year when you know the heather's out across the northeast of England and elsewhere. And on St Kilda, there's actually heather across most of the hills. It's just, it's like this big, if it's in a sheltered spot. So it's not so much knee but grazing as ankle tickling death, but yeah. <laughs> Any more comments or questions? Uh, oh, well, I, have one. Uh, I have one. I did have one about the grazing sheep. <coughs> you press the button in the middle and then it goes on. This one? Yeah, it's just half. You've got the portion of it halfway down. Half it. There we are. Uh, right. Yeah, is that on? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the estate, how old is the estate and the records and the archive that the estate would provide? Could you give us a little bit of information about the estate and where did it, um, when did it start in recorded time and um, how much is that a resource for your archaeology? It, it is, although at this point I normally f sort of field those questions by going, well it's more social history that than archaeology, <laughs> I'm adding in the rocks, but no, uh, there are there are estate records. Um, I believe there's also estate records for the McLeod estates in Sky that are, have still not been accessed. So a lot of the um, the main literature on St Kilda, they've kind of done the authors of those have done trawls of the estate records. In particular, Mary Harmon, who did a lot of work on St Kilda in the 1970s and 80s. Her uh, an aisle called her. There is um, the book that was the monograph of her PhD thesis, but she did a lot of that trawling all those old estate records and picking out the common threads in sort of going this one site to this many birds captured and this one and this one so it's likely to do this amount. So I must admit I've gone so far as reading Mary's and sort of going that's probably as close as I'm going to get to estate records anytime soon but I'm afraid I couldn't tell you um, exactly what dates they begin and end. I know that there are there are a lot of them and there's a lot of information in them and most of it has been um, accessed at some stage apart from I think like I say quite notably I think there is an archive in Sky and we look at. Okay. So if that's all I'll ask Colin to come and uh, Thank you. Um, is that on? Yeah. What a, a wonderful evening we've had uh, today. Um, I'm sure this uh, audience has got more people in it than uh, who've actually visited St Kilda than you'd find in the typical population. Uh, but even so, there's quite a, a lot of us who've probably only seen it as a, a dot on the horizon, much like those early settlers who were in the Western Isles who must have wondered what, what was on St Kilda and indeed perhaps they thought it was a, just the, the nearest point of a much larger land for all we know. Um, but um, uh, we are, we've, it's certainly been brought alive uh, to, to us tonight and it's been a really fascinating talk and I ask you to, to thank our speaker in the usual way.